Welcome to Handmade Happenings. I'm Marissa and today I'm in the kitchen because I'm talking about basic bread making. So what I'm going to do today is go over all of the steps that pretty much I've seen in every sandwich bread making recipe and just cover what do they mean, what does it look like, and then you can apply it to whatever bread recipe that you have. I will also link the recipe that I'm using today in the description as well as a few others that I like. So your first step is going to be proofing your yeast and I'm going to use as vague of terms as possible in case you have a different recipe or whatever your recipe calls for. So you're going to place your warm liquid in your bowl along with your yeast and this is instant yeast. And basically what you're doing here is you're activating your yeast as well as making sure that your yeast is actually good because if your yeast is not good then your bread's not going to rise. So you're just going to put it in the bowl with your warm liquid about, I believe it's like 105 to 110 degrees or so, but usually if it's water I just turn the warm water from the faucet. I was once told basically like warm bath water is what you want and you put it in your bowl and let it sit for uh, five to ten minutes. I've even seen some recipes say 30 minutes. Basically you want the yeast to be foamy and I'll show you what that looks like when we come back. Okay so it's been a few minutes my yeast has dissolved and is it didn't get foamy like it sometimes does, but I haven't had a problem with this yeast, so I'm going to go ahead with it. Sometimes it'll kind of like almost pillow up on top of the um, water. It's cold today, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But I no longer see the like round beads that I usually see when I first put the yeast in, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. The next step is just typically to add all of the other ingredients in the recipe. This one is a simple recipe today. It's only got your sweetener, um, some oil, salt, and flour. I have seen some recipes include powdered milk. This one doesn't today. So I'm just going to add everything except for the flour. And that's because I always add the flour last. Now you'll notice in a lot of recipes, they don't give an exact amount of flour. And that's because it can vary from kitchen to kitchen and even just the temperature in your kitchen. Now when I started making bread, I rarely did anything but just throw in the amount of flour that the recipe called for. And it worked evidently, I don't know, my kitchen must be relatively normal I guess, I don't know, um, but it always worked for me. However, I took a class that taught me finally how to kind of add the flour according to sight more so than the measurements. So that's what we're going to do next. I'm using a dough whisk and I mean, you can use a spoon if you have one, if you don't have a dough whisk, or your mixer. I find, for whatever reason, that I have done bread by hand for so long that I almost can't tell with the mixer sometimes when it's ready. I have a harder time with the texture. All right, so obviously this is not enough because you can see it's still very wet. So, just going to keep adding. Most recipes will call for it, you know, the bowl to come clean, which is actually a pretty accurate description because if you get the right amount of flour in here, you won't have a lot of liquid and you won't have like a lot of excess flour where it's like it clumps or like you, you know, like your bowl is dusted with flour. It won't be that and it won't be liquid, it won't be sticking to the sides of your bowl. And if your recipe has measurements, you could just start with like the lower amount and just keep adding gradually. That'll, that would eliminate some of this. So you can see right now, 
it is still kind of sticking to the sides of the bowl. It hasn't really come together in a full clump. You can see how it's kind of all come together right in the middle. And we're ready to start kneading. Okay, so for kneading your dough, you don't want to necessarily add a ton of flour onto your surface because you've already brought the dough to a pretty good hydration. Yeah, this may be still a little loose, but. So you can see how this dough or bowl is relatively clean. There's not gonna be like a lot of cleanup to this bowl. I probably could have added a little more flour to it. Sometimes it's hard to tell, but overall, this is a good consistency. But flour on the counter. I'm gonna flour my hands. I usually just, you know, put it in and rub my hands together. I do it right over top of the um, dough so that way the top gets floured a little. I do add a little to like right there. And if you have a bench scraper, keep it close by. This is really helpful for um, just making sure that your surface doesn't get too wet. Well, I'm going to start today by flouring it some more because evidently I did jump the gun a little on when this needed to be finished. This is doable and it's probably going to be lighter because it is um, not as heavily floured as it could have been. It happens sometimes. Some, some days, but it just turns out better than others. But honestly, too little flour can be easier to fix than, you know, not enough because you are still going to be flouring your surface, so. And you can see this is where the bench scraper really comes in handy. So when kneading your dough, you can start with just kind of pushing and pulling it back and doing a quarter tone like this. Um, I don't tend to do this particular technique as often. I don't know why. I think I learned a different way originally and therefore that's what I do, which is kind of a two-handed method. So push and push back and forth like this. I once saw it described as like a heart shape method because if you have a lot of uh, flour on your surface, it kind of starts to shape a heart in your flour. And kneading is one of those things that I always did not do enough of when I started. And I'm gonna blame that a little bit on reading um, historic books and I don't know, maybe shows and things where you read where it's like somebody takes their frustration out while kneading the bread dough and you end up with tough bread. Um, that's a myth. I've seen it debunked a few times in different YouTube videos. Chances are if you're hand kneading, you're not going to over knead your bread. And in a minute I will show you a technique that can help you to determine when you've needed enough. So after you've kneaded a bit, 
you're going to do what's called the window pane test. And this is just to see if you've developed enough gluten to give the bread strength, the dough strength for rising. So you're gonna take off a small piece and you're gonna roll it kind of into a ball. This is actually bigger than I need it, but anyway. And I find it's helpful to make sure your hands are either clean or well floured. Same goes for the um, piece of dough because otherwise if it's sticking, this test is just not going to help at all. And you're just going to stretch it slowly. Oh wow, I must have actually kneaded this well enough. Um, and if it stretches to the point where it's thin enough that you can see light through it before it breaks, then you've developed enough gluten. And mine actually might be there. I, I doubt this comes up on camera, but if this was underdeveloped, then it would have just torn long before it got thin enough to see through it. I'm going to do another piece just to make sure that that wasn't like somehow a fluke. But it is stretching really thin without tearing. So it's ready for its first rise. So I'm just going to put it in a bowl. I like these containers. They have a lid and they also have a measuring device on the sides, which can be helpful for um, this next step because it helps to see when your dough has doubled. Rice time does vary according to the temperature in your house and it is a cold day. However, we have the wood stove going so I'm going to stick it in front of that and hopefully that will um, get it going. Uh, I usually start at 30 minutes and check. A lot of times the first rise takes longer and so I just cover it with the lid of the bowl. I don't push it down because I've had the lids pop off that way. Usually the recommendation is covering it with a damp tea towel. I found that just the lid is fine. Just to clear up a few things that I forgot in the last clip. Um, like I said, I do put my bread dough by the wood stove usually during the winter so that it can rise. Obviously not too close if you have a wood stove because you know, you're not trying to bake the bread, you're just trying to get it to rise. Uh, but obviously not everyone has wood stoves. What I do when the wood stove isn't going and when it's not like summer and just hot anyway, is usually I will put my bread dough in the oven with the pilot light on. Now, this only works um, well really for the first rise. During the second rise, you're gonna have to find someplace else or make sure you pull your dough out before you preheat the oven. Okay, so it's been about an hour and a half actually since I put the dough to rise. Actually, that's what the recipe called for. I missed that part. To me, this took a while. Like I said, it can depend on the recipe, your house, temperatures. It's cold today. But you can see it has doubled. And you can see that visually in this case because it was like way down here. It wasn't even on the line. And then it's reached one quart. So that's one way I can tell that it's ready. Another way is what's called the poke test, which is what I'm going to demonstrate next. So to determine if your bread has risen enough is just by taking your finger and lightly pushing down. And you can see how the dough held that dent where I pressed in. That means it's stopped rising and it's ready to be shaped. So the first step to shaping is one of the most satisfying parts of bread baking, which is just punching down the dough to let out all the air and gas. And we're gonna let that sit for a minute and talk about the loaf pan. Now mom already greased this for me. Uh, your recipe will sometimes call for shortening. We used lard, um, sometimes olive oil or butter, but you're just going to run it all on the bottom and up the sides of the pans. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but when I do it, there's always like visible streaks and that's how you like really know that you've gotten it greased well. So when it comes to shaping your loaf, 
um, when I first started, I pretty much never actually really shaped the loaf. I would just dump it in the pan and it was usually fine. Uh, I think in a way that shaping a loaf is more for if you have a loaf that is going to be not in a pan, like if you're doing one on a baking stone, then you probably need to shape it more because you want it to hold its shape. But generally when it's going in a loaf pan, it's not as big of a deal. But basically, you wanna kinda of shape it up into a rectangle, tuck those ends in, and then flip it over and kind of roll it a bit. This is a really wet dough. Again, I think I kind of jumped the gun on pulling the dough out of the um, bowl, but if it was drier, what I would do is I would slam it on the counter to get out air bubbles. Since this is so wet, I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to put it straight into the loaf pan. So it's in the loaf pan. I'm gonna put it back in my warm spot in front of the wood stove. Uh, the recipe calls for it to be about an hour and based on the first rise, I'm gonna guess that it's accurate. Um, and so when it's done, do another poke test. That, um, another thing you can look for on the second loaf is that like usually once it gets up to the uh, top of the pan, or maybe an inch above is usually when it's ready. Second rise is a lot more particular than the first rise, so you really want to make sure you get it, get it in the oven before it over ferments because or over rises because what it'll do is it will collapse in the oven and you'll have a very dense loaf. And what I personally do is about 15 minutes before I think it'll be ready is when I come downstairs and preheat the oven because mm, the oven takes about 15 minutes to heat. So usually it all works out so that I can put the loaf straight in the oven when it's done with its second rise. It's been an hour, a little over an hour actually, and the bread has risen to almost the top of the pan. And it is still popping back up, but again, you can see just that slight indention where I pressed it. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in the oven because to me, you're better off under proofing it than over proofing it. And here's the loaf. It's usually best to let it cool before slicing. Um, ideally, if you can resist the urge to cut into it, it's best to let it cool completely. Uh, after all of the trouble that this loaf has given me today, I am probably going to at least have one slice warm with butter, but I am gonna let it cool a bit first. Is the bread making process. Now I'm going to be honest, I had a lot of doubts and troubles with this loaf of bread. Um, it was a cold day, I was trying a new recipe, and for some reason it often seems like there are a lot of things that I can do really well right up until I turn on the camera and then it just doesn't seem to want to work right. But um, let that maybe be a little encouraging that um, even when things go wrong, there is still a good chance that you will turn out with a very good loaf. In fact, I would say that most of the time the worst thing you can do to a loaf is um, 
either forget to put yeast in or allow it to overproof on that second rise, which will then cause a very dense loaf. But otherwise, I usually don't have a lot of problems with bread. It, it may not turn out perfectly, but it is still usually really good.